Over the weekend, our daughter was home. Now, our daughter is super smart and very funny. And for her work, she works for a creative agency. She has to put together a presentation about chat GPT. Now, if you know Harriet, you'll know that whatever she turns her hand to is absolutely brilliant. And this particular presentation is no different. But one thing certainly came to the fore. It really does lift the lid on a fundamental truth about artificial intelligence. And that is, you cannot accept what it gives you without double or possibly triple checking the facts. It has no concept of truth. None. Nothing. It's not human. We think it is. Chat GPT is not lying. It's simply making inferences based on the training that it has. It only infers answers from the data it has seen. And if the data is incorrect or simply not present, it doesn't necessarily have a sense of accuracy. So purely for fun, we searched for me and two things sprang out. Firstly, and quite importantly, is it got some facts wrong. Simply wrong. They're not true. Never happened. Never will happen. Just not right. And we double checked which of the many Paul Wilkinsons there are out there it was talking about. No, it was definitely talking about me. It simply got it wrong. However, on the flip side of that coin, the bits that it got right, it got so right that the sales material that it accidentally produced is better than anything I could do for myself. Interesting, huh? So where it got it wrong, it got it very, very wrong. And when it got it right, it got it better than right. So from now on in, I think I'm going to use ChatGPT for all of my marketing materials, provided, provided that you go and research to make sure it's true. I'm Paul. I'm an ex-astronaut and portrait photographer, author of many, many books, international empresario, father of eight. And the one thing you can rely on in this particular bit of text is this is the Mastering Portrait Photography podcast. Ah, yes. Artificial intelligence. I do promise at some point I'll do a proper in-depth as to what's going on and why AI has to be taken with a massive pinch of salt. I'm not saying it's not useful, but I am saying it really isn't what an awful lot of the hype is describing it as. But that's one for a later episode. So what has happened in the past couple of weeks? Well, I say past couple of weeks, <laughs> technically a couple of months. Seriously, I really did think that I would get to do podcasts every couple of weeks this year. We've got it all scheduled out. Uh, our timetable has been modified to allow time, supposedly allow time. And all that's happened is that like every photography studio, we got busy. Uh, so eight weeks ago, I recorded the last one, although I didn't publish it until I returned from a skiing trip. And on that note, that's exactly what we did after Christmas. Uh, had a fantastic couple of weeks on the snow. I don't remember the last time I did that. And we did it with our family. Uh, some friends of ours, some very kind, generous, lovely people have a chalet in the Italian Dolomites, which, by the way, if you've never been, is more beautiful, is more reliable snow. It's, it's simply stunning. Uh, and uh, yeah, everyone heads to the Alps and I don't, for the entire, I don't entirely know why. Try the Dolomites. You'll absolutely love it. Um, so we had a couple of weeks skiing, got back, and then, of course, raced straight in to uh, the job. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, saw Peter Kay. Oh man, if you get a chance to go, you should go. It's absolutely brilliant. I think the only fly in the ointment was, or probably is, because I doubt this is going to change anytime soon, is that London uh, Transport for London, TfL, dug up the Jubilee line, which meant that essentially you couldn't get to the O2 Arena. That's 80,000 tickets uh, every night and they dug up the one underground line to get there. Brilliant. Well done, TfL. That's, that's really smart of you. So London, or certainly that part of London, just heading across the river, was utterly gridlocked. We had booked with some friends to go and have a meal and then go see Peter Kay. So a whole afternoon and evening. And in fact, we spent the whole afternoon in a traffic jam. It was so bad that at one point the taxi driver started to panic that his car was visibly overheating. You could see the needle just climbing. We've been sat in a traffic jam for an hour and a bit. And for whatever reason, I suspect he hasn't had his fan service for a while. Uh, it was just going to overheat. We were going to end up stranded. 
And luckily for me, the ghost of my father, <laughs> the ghost of my dad in my ears, because me and him always owned old cars. Uh, and the trick, the trick is to turn your fans on full, turn the heat up to maximum and just open the windows because you're going to sweat. But having the heat being extracted through the fans draws the heat out of the engine and gives you a fighting chance of keeping the thing alive. And it did. We arrived. We managed to just about grab the most important thing around a gin and tonics and a beer for me and uh, had a little bit of sushi and had the best night in ages. Peter Kay was absolutely uh, brilliant. Uh, we've had some beautiful shoots. You'd expect me to say that, I suppose. Hearing dogs have been absolutely flying, uh, photographing for those guys. It seems that we've uh, run into a, a sequence of every week being down there, which is always, always good fun. Plenty of portrait shoots. Uh, weddings, haven't done any weddings this year. Uh, they come up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we didn't take any bookings for the early part of the year because we weren't quite certain uh, what we would be planning. But we are winding those down a little bit, uh, hopefully. Anyway, this year, we'll see how that goes because right now we are really focusing on uh, mastering portrait photography and all of our portrait work. Uh, what else have we done? Oh, sorting, judging, sorting the judging for the British Institute of Professional Photographers. Now, you know this, you know I love judging. And being chair of awards and qualifications for the BRPP is not just an honour, and it is an honour. It is also a complete pleasure because I get to judge regularly. I get to sit with other photographers learning, critiquing, encouraging, cajoling, just by assessing people's work. And it is one of the highlights of the year. So the planning for that is very much going in. And it's Sarah who is making that possible, as you might expect, because I am not the world's greatest planner. Uh, I can put together the schedules, but then it takes just someone who is list-oriented. And I'm anything but list-oriented. Uh, I'm really not. I'm, I'm sitting recording this podcast without a script, as normal. I've got some bullet points to hit, but that's about all. Um, and so Sarah's giving me a hand, getting that all organised and in the diary. So on that note, if you are a BIPP member and you have been thinking about and putting off, no doubt, doing your qualifications, uh, the first round, there's some spaces on the first round. It is the 28th of March, 28th and 29th of March. You have just about enough time to get your panel sorted and get them in. So why not have a chat with your mentor? See if you can do it because now qualifications are not everybody's cup of tea. I do understand that. I really do. Um, not everybody thinks that having letters after your name makes any difference at all. And again, that's absolutely true. Not everybody has letters after the name and some of the best photographers I've ever met never went near an association or a qualifications process and they're stunning photographers. They don't need it. But I don't think you can argue that going through the process isn't a good thing. I'm not saying not going through the process will necessarily inhibit you. I am saying that going through the process will definitely create opportunities to improve. There's no doubt about that, I don't think. The whole process, the thought process, the self-analysis, going through your images, sitting with a mentor, putting together a panel of 20 images, everything about that process makes you a better photographer, or at least gives you the opportunity to be a better photographer. So uh, I know it's expensive. I do understand that. Of course it is. And at this particular period in our economy, that may not be something everyone can stomach. But think about it the other way around. Think about the value that it will bring to you and your business, or think about the things you might be missing out on. For instance, with the judging, we can only have fellows who are judging. And yet I know some incredible photographers who I'd love to have on that panel of judges, but you must be a fellow. Why? Is it because you're a better photographer? Not entirely. It's because you know the process. You know what it takes to, to get to that level. That's why we choose fellows. That's why we use them. Um, so if you have the opportunity to, why not talk to your mentor? 28th, 29th of March for the BIPP. Uh, and I simply cannot wait. Uh, well, so workshops. We have set out a program of workshops. The last workshop we ran was the Mastering Advanced Studio Lighting. All of our workshops have the word mastering in because, as you might have gathered, we piggybacked off the brand of Mastering Portrait Photography, which is the book Sarah Plater and I created back in 2015. Um, still, still selling. I still get requests for signed copies, um, which is flattering. It's just lovely. Uh, but we've piggybacked all of our workshops off the name Mastering because as a brand, that seems to be 
a really good idea. So we ran the first workshop of this year, which was Mastering Advanced Studio Lighting, which basically was modifiers, gobos, gels, scrims, you, you name it, we tried it. And when I say try it, I mean that. So although we put together, with every workshop, we put together a kind of schedule, a tick list of things that we think we'll cover. In the end, when we meet the attendees or in, in advance of the workshop, we ask the attendees as well, what would you like to go through? So we have a very limited number. There's only ever six, six attendees on a workshop, which gives us the flexibility to change and adapt each of the workshops to allow and, and to truly represent what people want to learn. And sure enough, we got a load of requests for different things. So we did a ton of work with gels. We did work with scrims. We used some gobos uh, to project different patterns onto walls and onto models' faces and things. It's, none of it's particularly complicated, but sometimes it's not the complexity of the actual techniques, but it's just having a go and firing off each other. It's just brilliant to be in a room actually, with a whole load of people uh, having a ball. And that's something I don't know that necessarily I appreciated when we set out on this road, but absolutely, I love running the workshops. They're brilliant. They're funny. We get a room full of creative people. I come away with stuff. They come away with stuff. And on top of that, we have the best lunch in the world, which also, as you'd know, because I'm quite stomach-oriented uh, or food-oriented, like a dog, really, um, I have to have a really nice lunch. So we have set out the program of workshops for the coming few months, and I'll talk through those at the end of the podcast. So either you can listen to the rest of this podcast or you can crank your way to the end and get pen and paper out. Uh, but I'll also put them down in the show notes. So that's what we've been up to. Uh, very busy. Uh, lots going on. I thought the idea has been to slow everything down and give me plenty of opportunity to record podcasts, uh, get on top of the training side of it. Uh, and in fact, all that's really happened for a moment uh, is we filled it with uh, client work. Anyway, on to the topic of this particular podcast. So one of the things about being a photographer, of course, is that we are all incredibly visual people. You might use other words, I suppose, for photographers. Slightly flaky, creative, obviously visual, people, people, most of us, although I suspect those that like to sit in a hide or up on a mountain top for weeks on end. Maybe they're not people people, maybe they're purely vi visual people. But for all of the people in the sectors that I work in, very peoply, very huggy on the whole, very huggy. <laughs> and I love that. I love that. But we tend to think of everything about being pictures, but words, words. I mean, think about it. this podcast is all words, our blogs are words. I will guarantee that 99% of you, the first time someone said they loved you, they used the words, I love you. They didn't show you a picture of it. And they might have hinted at it, I suppose. But it's the words. It's the words that can truly build you up or truly knock you flat. So here's a note that dropped through our door last week. Now, this is handwritten. It dropped through our door last week. It's handwritten. So it'll take me a minute. And it doesn't matter how many times I've read it, I still get caught up uh, in the words. Dear Paul, this is a long overdue, but nonetheless heartfelt thank you to you, Sarah and Michelle for the astounding, I think it says astounding, and beautiful photography, exceptional experience and service for our wedding day on the 6th of October and our follow-up visit to the studio in November. We cannot express enough gratitude for the energy you brought to our special day and also your understanding going above and beyond on the day's events, or sorry, as the day's events unfolded as we were relocated from our original venue to a new venue and even giving us a lift there to boot. <laughs> so it's good. That's a nice phrase, to boot. It's not one that I use very much. I might adopt that. Uh, you were a huge part of our day, and we are so glad we chose you. You have created a very special experience and service from our first meeting, the day itself, to our show, showreel reveal with Sarah, who is wonderful, and the generous lunch served up to the ex... So it goes back to the lunch. Notice, back to the lunch. We always have a nice lunch. To the excellent lunch served up. Uh, sorry, to the... A generous lunch served up to the excellent coordination with Michelle. It felt like we were being looked after by a very professional and friendly team who cared about her day, our day, as much as us. We cannot thank you enough, and we are so looking forward to seeing the final album and our chosen prints. With enormous gratitude, very best wishes to you and all the team. So that note dropped in our door uh, 
I guess, probably 10 days ago now. And we are still smiling. And we get a lot of thank you notes, uh, but usually uh, they're usually a bit shorter than that. And I love every single one of them. Just someone writing to us to say, we did a good job. Now, we charge for the job. We're a service industry, right? This is the photography business, not the photography hobby. So I'm charging for all of this work. And yet still, having charged a client, that is still the thank you note that they wrote to us. And it got me thinking a little bit about saying thank you. It's one of the most powerful tools we have in our toolbox. And it's not just when our clients write to us. It's when we say thank you to the people that make our job possible. To our clients, of course, I'm always grateful because they're the people that put money in the bank. Now, I went to a photography seminar 15 years ago, I think, uh, probably at Focus on Imaging, as I think it was back then, at the NEC in Birmingham. And I went with a mate of mine to go and see a particular photographer who I've been a fan of for a long time. So I went to see his seminar. And for the entire thing, all he did was bitch about his clients. He didn't have a nice thing to say about them. Everything he said was, well, pretty horrible, to be honest. And I came away demoralized. I, I was just on the cusp at that point of deciding to come into the industry. And I nearly decided it wasn't the place for me. Everything he said, he was derogatory. He was rude. He thought he was being funny, but I took away that he really didn't like and respect his clients. Now, that's fine. If you work in a sector where you don't have to deal with your clients, you can be as rude as you like. But imagine being face to face. He was a wedding and portrait photographer. Imagine being face to face with people that actually in the back of your mind you don't like every day. And I would highly recommend that if that's how you feel about people, go do something else. It really, really upset me. We here could not be further from that. I am forever thrilled that I have our clients. I am forever grateful. Even this weekend, a photographer actually and her family came for a shoot. It was an absolute joy. It was full of energy, full of laughter, a little bit of nerves. Obviously, whenever you're photographing a photographer, there's an added layer of insecurity, I suppose, and because people bring in with them their own expectations. Uh, it's not the first time I ph photographed them. Um, so it wasn't that I was worried, but there's still, I don't know, you get an additional adrenaline kick but it was just a ball and I'm forever grateful. And I think it's important to know and to say so. Tell your clients, tell your clients, thank you. Say to them, it's just been an absolute pleasure working with you. And not because you don't mean it, not because it's a marketing line, it isn't. You have to actually believe it. Be grateful for the people that put food on your table. Also, your suppliers. We have the most incredible suppliers. I talk about them fairly often and I meet them reasonably regularly, whenever I can, to be honest. And thank you goes a long way. Just saying thanks. It's easy to pick up the phone or drop an email where, you're, where something has gone wrong, where something isn't quite right. And so you've picked the phone up and said, can you fix this? But then remember to pick it up at the end and say thanks. Say thanks for doing a good job. Sometimes, even if when everything is running smoothly, just say thanks. And it's lovely listening to my team, Michelle and Sarah, because they are supremely good at this. They will email back or ring a, uh, a supplier and just say thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you ever so much. They're really, really good at it. And because of that, we have incredible supplier loyalty. The guys I work with, well, they're the best in the world and I absolutely love it. But from me to, to Michelle and Sarah, probably I need to say thank you more. I do try. I do try to say thanks for an incredible job. For thank Just thanks for being there sometimes. Thanks for laughing when I'm feeling down, because I do. Just thanks. I think that's just a really lovely thing, far more than any picture. I know they say a picture says a thousand words, but I think the words thank and you say ten times that. Try it. You might just like it. Right. There you go. There's... <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes this podcast is me just floating along, and then sometimes it does sound like I've climbed onto a soapbox. So on that happy note, thank you to you, our listeners, for being there and listening to this podcast. I had a lovely note last night that's uh, from a landscape photographer in North Wales. It dropped in, and it just said, he's a landscape photographer, I don't do portraits, but ha having landed on Mastering Portrait Photography and listened to them, loving, I think he said he's loving the podcast, 
uh, he's thinking about doing portraits. What a lovely thing. So thank you. Thank you to each of you for listening. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you there, to know that I'm not just recording this and it's disappearing out into the ether. Uh, right. So here's the end of the podcast. And here are the dates for the workshops that we have in the diary. The 6th of March, that's a week today. I'm recording this on the 27th of Feb, 6th of March. Mastering Essential Studio Lighting, which is a day messing around in the studio, trying things out, showing just how much you can achieve with very little, to be honest. I laugh a lot at photographers because we do love a bit of Rembrandt lighting. And we, we sort of hold it up as the epitome of moody light, and it is. But it was lit with one light. <laughs> so you end up in a studio with 25 lights. And really, well, you just need one and know where to place it. So that's Essential Studio Lighting, uh, 6th of March, 20th of March, Mastering Available Light. Available Light Portraiture, technically. This is all about people. Uh, every one of these is about people. I am really a portrait photographer. So that's the 20th of March, Mastering Available Light. 3rd of April, Mastering Headshot Photography. So unusually for us, this is one that's topic-driven as opposed to technique-driven, if you see what I mean. We're trying some things out to see whether it's more fun or more useful to arrange it, build it around a particular topic, such as headshots or child portraiture or whatever, as opposed to techniques such as studio lighting. The 17th of April, Mastering Your Creative Workflow from Shutter to Print. Uh, this is one that is always slightly harder to sell but it's probably the most important of all the workshops that we run. It's all about getting results quickly, because at the end of the day, this is a business. And the, all of these courses are premised on being pro or semi-pro or earning money from your photography. And getting your workflow right, making sure that from the minute you import the data onto your computers, that it's managed correctly, it's managed quickly, it's managed efficiently. And then all the way through some very fast Photoshop techniques to absolutely lift your images. These are not full on beauty retouch techniques. I can do those too. Uh, but 99% of our work here is not that. It's normal family portraiture. And for that, there's a certain level of retouching that's useful. Beyond that, yes, it's lovely to do it for competitions and it's lovely to do it when you get the opportunity to do it. But unless you can find a way of monetizing all of those, all of those hours, all of those hours <laughs> sat in front of one image, uh, then it's probably not economically the right way to go. So that's the 17th of April, mastering your creative workflow, workflow, can't even say it, workflow <laughs> from shutter to print. Maybe I should actually only do courses where I can say the words easily. Uh, right, 15th of May, mastering advanced studio lighting. So that's a rework. That's a rework of the one we did a few weeks ago. Uh, it was just brilliant. That was a wonderful day. Uh, seriously, I came away with as much energy and enthusiasm as the guys who were attending it. It was such a ball being in a room with creative people, seeing everyone's faces light up with new ideas and techniques to take and use in their studios. A lot of fun, a lot of inspiration and lots of really beautiful images came out of that one. Uh, and then on the 5th of June, this is the last one that we've got in the diary just yet, uh, but we'll keep them updated. Uh, that's Mastering Available Light, but on location in Oxford. That's quite different. So we're going to do essentially a walking tour of Oxford with a camera, finding pockets of light. Of course, I've no idea where we'll end up because it depends entirely on the weather, whether it's sunny, whether we have a flat light day, whether it's cold, whether it's warm. Uh, we will use every bit of light that we can from the beautiful sandstone streets in Oxford, uh, probably down to the greenery because it's June, so it'll all be lush and green. Uh, down near Christchurch College, down by the parks. Uh, we will see where we end up. Usually I end up in a back street with some graffiti on a corrugated iron wall. Uh, and I find that just as interesting. So that's the 5th of June, Mastering Available Light on location in Oxford. Although each of those workshops is, we've already set out, if you go to our website at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk, you'll find them. We set out what each one likely will include. But just to be clear again, uh, the attendees help us drive the shape or help us shape each of the courses. So if everybody turns up and they want to learn a very particular thing, then of course we simply adapt and change. Uh, it's a majority driven thing. So we set out the kind of baseline topics, but then it's down to everyone who comes so that truly you get, you all get something out of it. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, and of course, at the end of each of the sessions, 
If you want to stick around for a bit, if there's something we couldn't cover and you want to just come around, stick around and ask questions, then of course you're very welcome to do so. I'll stay around, though I can't guarantee the models will. So if it's something photographic, uh, we might just have to grab someone, uh, someone else who stuck around and put them in front of the camera. So those are the dates, 6th of March, 20th of March, 3rd of April, 17th of April, 15th of May and 5th of June. If you Google Paul Wilkinson Photography Workshops, uh, you will find our site at the moment. All of these are on paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. Uh, eventually, I think we'll move them across onto the masteringportraitphotography.com site. Uh, but that's a piece of work that I haven't got to yet. Uh, we're slowly piecing together what we're going to do with each of the different brands we own, Paul Wilkinson Photography and, of course, Mastering Portrait Photography. Uh, there are, the, the places have sold pretty quick. Um, for the courses we've announced so far, the one, of course, I'm going to push today, we have a few places available, is the one next week, which is the 6th of March, Mastering Essential Studio Lighting. So if you fancy that, it'll be lots of techniques, some of which are for headshots, some of which are for uh, family portraits. We might do a little bit of dramatic low-key, but it's lots of things that you can try with very simple, very simple lighting in your studio, ranging from umbrellas, bare head. Uh, we'll probably use a softbox or two. We might play with a bit of continuous light if somebody fancies it. Uh, we have all of it at our fingertips so we can do anything you like. That's it. As an aside, one of the things I've always hated about studio lighting workshops is you have to keep switching the triggers. We even have a set of triggers so that once they're bolted to your camera, you don't need to change them. Ha! Uh, a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> and I think it's important. So if you do fancy it, there are places available. Just search for Paul Wilkinson Photography Workshops and book your space now. Ooh, <laughs> that was quite salesy. Book your space now. Call to action, I think that's called, in sales parlance. Uh, get me, being all salesy. Anyway, do it. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to the very end of this Mastering Portrait Photography podcast. I'm sorry if I'm rambling on, but hey, you know, we're on episode, episode 134. I still can't say the word episode. But we are on episode 134. So there must be people out there listening. It keeps itself in the charts for photography podcasts, which I think is just wonderful. So thank you to each of you for listening. And thank you in particular for getting to the end. Remember, whatever else, be kind to yourself. Take care. <laughs>